This is episode number 134 about the Irish plein air event taking Europe by storm and about plein air painting around the world. This is the Plein Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. In the Plein Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plein Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plein Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping, and welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. My name is Eric, and I hope you're having a wonderful summer. It seems to me like it's going by a little bit too fast. We've moved into a new place this summer, and we've been kind of unpacking boxes and doing chores and errands and well, painting has had a kind of a back seat for me, so I'm not getting out as much as I want to, but I'm going to try to break out the paints again this weekend. I've got them in the car, and I'm hoping to steal some moments. I'm still here in the Adirondacks, and the weather is spectacular, just spectacular. One cool thing that's happening is the Plen Air Convention. It's coming up in Denver in early May. It's the best-selling convention we've ever had. In fact, we've already exceeded the attendance numbers for San Francisco, and we're soon to exceed everything we've ever done. I think it's going to sell out months early uh, because the numbers are just huge. And once we get to these deadlines where the price goes up, um, there's not going to be any seats left, I'm guessing. So I know it's a busy summer. It's hard to think about next spring, next May, but the lineup is spectacular. Scott Christensen, Joanna Arnett, Kwong Ho, Thomas Schaller, the amazing watercolorist, Peggy Kroll Roberts and Ray Roberts, Don Whitelaw, Daniel Sprick. Dan Sprick is kind of known as a figurative artist, one of the best plein air painters I've ever seen in my life. He came to the plein air convention and hung out, and uh, he's coming back to be on the stage. Mike Hernandez, who is the uh, animator but is an incredible artist, Larry Putnam, John McDonald, Kim Lardier, Ken Salas, Stephanie Birdsall, there's so many, I can't mention them all. I'm sorry to those who I'm not mentioning. But anyway, you can register at plenairconvention.com. And of course, we're going out to Estes Park, to the Rocky Mountain National Park, and it's just going to be spectacular. So uh, we got people coming in from all over the world this year. A lot of them already registered. So if that's you, I hope you'll come. Register at plenairconvention.com. And... If you happen to love figure painting, we have another convention that is like the plein air convention. The only difference is we don't go outdoors to paint, but we have a big studio with models, and we paint in the big studio so you can practice what you've learned. So we do figures and portraits and nudes and non-nudes. It's happening in November in Williamsburg, Virginia. The lineup is powerful. From Russia, this is like, we've tried to pull this off last year. We thought we had it pulled off. The last minute, he couldn't get his visa, but we finally pulled this off. From Russia, the great Russian master, Nikolai Blokhin. Uh, he is amazing. He's one of the best-selling artists in the world. He does these incredible things, and this is a rare U.S. appearance. I don't think he's ever been on stage teaching in America, and it's tough to get him here from, from Russia. Also, another rarity from Florence, Italy, the master, John Michael Angel, the founder of the Angel Academy. He's taught some of the best artists in the world, including somebody like Cesar Santos, and he's going to be teaching. He's also doing a pre-convention workshop. He's incredible. The lineup is just stellar. Gabriela Gonzalez, Deloso, Dan Thompson, Josh LaRock, Adrian Gottlieb, Patty Watwood, Michael Klein, Casey Baugh, Teresa Ohaka, uh, there's so many more, I haven't even begun to tap it. It's November 10th through 13th and has a pre-convention shop workshop with um, John Michael, Michael John Angel and also a drawing workshop with a, the amazing Daniel Maidman. And so if you want to learn how to draw, you want to learn how to paint, you want to perfect your skills, take them to the next level, then this event is going to just explode you. It's just such a great event. It's a lot of fun. It's not stuffy. Anyway, you can practice what you learn 
in the world's largest studio. We've got over a dozen models. We're also doing a plein air paint out in the streets of Colonial Williamsburg. It's historic. It's like a living museum. We're going to have models in the streets and period costumes. Anyway, the event's called FACE, the Figurative Art Convention and Expo. And the price goes up on July 31st because it's coming up in uh, November. So if you want to get in, say, 400 bucks, register before July 31st. You can learn more at figurativeartconvention.com. A lot of people from the Plein Air Convention registered, I think over 80 of them. So that's pretty big. Um, anyway, it's going to be a, a good year. And so make sure you check that out. Coming up after the interview, I'm going to be answering some art marketing questions in the Marketing Minute. Uh, I thought this would be kind of a good thing because I keep hearing about art in the open in Ireland. It's a great event. And I thought, well, well let's interview them. Let's find out what's going on in Ireland and, and plein air painting. So let's get started. Well, today we have three very special guests from Art in the Open in Ireland. I'd like to introduce you in no particular order of prominence, but uh, Tony Robinson, the secretary of the organization, Neil O'Keefe, the chairman of Art in the Open, and Jane Myler, who is the treasurer of the organization. Uh, this has become a pretty prominent event in plein air circles and certainly a prominent event uh, uh, in internationally. Welcome to the show, folks. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks very much. So what I'd like to understand is uh, maybe one of you would kind of take it on and, and kind of give our listeners a little bit of an overview about uh, the event itself, when it takes place, and uh, how it started. And you guys can figure out who's going to take that, or you can all take it on. I'll take that, uh, Eric. Uh, Neil O'Keefe here. Basically, the event started about 12 years ago. This is our 12th event. Uh, it started primarily as a, uh, a small event for our own benefit. There was a, a few plein air painters in Wexford who uh, enjoyed painting outdoors and in a group. And uh, Tony had been to America and or had uh, come across festivals plein air festivals in America and suggested that we start one of our own and we did that. Good for you, Tony. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I was, I had a few pints of Guinness at the time. <laughs> and so were the rest of us. <laughs> so are, are you saying you're having regrets now? Is that what you're suggesting? Not in the slightest, actually. It has been a fantastic success from our point of view. We've really enjoyed hosting it, the friends we've made over the years. And uh, it started just as a weekend, didn't it? It did, yeah, yeah. and it's grown. Um, it's grown so much. Like we've got magnificent support, and I think that's really what has kept us uh, motivated. We've been initially supported by our own local authority, who very generously uh, donated the mayor a prize, which they call the mayoral award, and they have been buying the prize-winning painting every year for their own collection. Local uh, businesses backed us. Uh, private individuals back to us, you know, and then people like your good selves who are sponsoring the plein air uh, award have come on board and all of this keeps uh, reinforcing uh, our motivation and reinforcing the success that we're experiencing. Well, perhaps we can get a little bit granular. Uh, tell me mm -hmm. uh, what the event is like and how it differs or if it differs from uh, the plein air events that we might know here in the States. Yeah, yes, um, Eric, you know, I was over at the Plain Air Convention and I actually had only taken part in my first year here um, and absolutely loved the whole idea of painting outdoors and jumped on board to get to get to um, Las Vegas and, and to Monterey was great. So I, and connecting with all the artists, I learned so much. So bringing that back here, um, it's slightly different in the fact that every, which I think you would like is that everybody is encouraging everyone to paint. And anyone has any interest, always encouraging people to come outside and learn. And we truly believe you'll learn more from being outside painting. Um, now, the size, the size has grown. We've up to 220 artists now. Um, it's, and it's still, even though it's a big number of people, we're still very close. It's not too many that it's, that, um, you know, people are losing touch. We're still very intimate. Um, which so is you're, one. You're, you're saying, Jane, that there are 220 painters participating in your event. Yes, from 18 different countries this year, which 18 is 18 countries, that's fabulous. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and so 
Um, this is a, if, if I understand it correctly, this is a non-juried event. So you're not necessarily focusing on bringing in uh, a, a specific group of people who have been juried in who may be professionals. It's just an, anybody who can, who well, wants our, to come. Well, our, our invitation to, to, for the educational element, we do invite um, well-known artists that can do workshops and, and the people who come, they can take part in them. So there is, there are a lot of top artists coming and it's a, it's a great mix and it's always wonderful that there is, it's there, people are coming and they get a chance to work with. And we have so many that come from the States, so many names. Um, I've actually, I've, and we've made so many friendships. I mean, it was Laurie herself who came, who came first, herself and Mark arrived in 2012. And that's how I got connected with her over in America at the convention. And we've, since then, we'd met, we, Ned Muller's come, Mark D'Alessio, Joe Paquette, Billy O'Donnell, Karen Margulis. They were all people who met over there. Um, and each, each year they hear about by word of mouth, you know. Um, Laurie's been great at, at um, telling everybody about this festival and how wonderful it is and it's grown. And we're always grateful. And we've, well, so we've got Keiko Tanabe. This year we actually have Kevin McPherson as our headline, which is wonderful. And Ray and Peggy Crow Roberts, who I met over there too. Um, and... Thomas Kitts, which is great. And Thomas, Thomas is coming this year for his first time, and he's doing a talk on Sirius, which is wonderful, um, on his DVD. So yeah, it's 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 growing. Um, well, not by word of mouth, really, isn't it? And should be as with the plain air. Um, we've thirty six from America coming this year, which is wonderful. Um, so so, um, how long is the event? How many days does it take place? Uh, it yeah. takes place over about nine days, Eric. And initially, it was as the, as the lads were saying, just a long weekend, and and initially we expected it would just be really an Irish event, but it became popular with people coming from overseas, and so we realised for for it to be worth their while to come, we'd have to expand it and make it kind of a week's holiday. That seemed to be what people wanted. So it's probably, you know, it's it kind of in its feel, it's, uh, I, I imagine it's a bit like your event in the Adirondacks. It's kind of a, um, you know, you're invited to come and just hang out with the guys kind of thing. We do have decent prize money for it, but it's not particularly, um, what you call a competitive event or that sort of thing. So, uh, so it works. It's now, now lasts for about nine days. And uh, each day we take people to a different venue. Uh, so there's a different location. We run a coach bus or some people drive if they want to rent a car or, or if they're Irish, use their own transport. Um, and we go to, of course, we've got a lot of historical things to see. Uh, we've got beaches, we've got harbours and that sort of thing. There's lots of nice rural environment. We've got castles and stuff. And each year we go to different venues, but that's kind of the theme of it. And, of course, uh, you guys from over in the United States seem to, seem to lap that up. You like it too. So, uh, so that, that's kind of the key to our success. Now, if, if I were to attend, uh, which I will one day, I just haven't got it, gotten over there yet. It's, the Adirondacks are so beautiful for me, it's hard for me to leave, but I would imagine it's even more beautiful in Ireland. I've never been. Um, the, uh, if, if, do I have to pay to attend? Do I have to pay for the bus? Do, uh, how do I deal with yeah. lodging? What are those kinds of answers? Basically, um, registration is, is online through... Uh, what was known as Reg Online, I think they're changing their name this year, but it is, uh, that has been probably the biggest uh, contribution to the growth of the festival. Initially, we used mail out uh, material to different art shops and things like that, but uh, another committee member, Kevin, he suggested we use Reg Online and uh, market it on the web, and that turned out to be phenomenally successful in that uh, people from all over the place who probably would never have got a sight of a, a poster or a, a leaflet suddenly became aware of the festival and started um, attending. I'd have to give a lot of credit to uh, one American 
David Diaz, who came to us uh, via a twin. Wexford is twinned uh, with Annapolis in Maryland. And David came here as our guest one year uh, as the nominee of the mayor of Annapolis. And it has probably been the single most uh, rewarding relationship we've developed over the years. David has been uh, has come back on his own bat every year. He's brought friends. Bruno Baran is coming with his wife, Audrey. David introduced us to uh, different artists in America. Well, as I say, it gave us an introduction and gave us a degree of credibility, I think, with those artists. And they came then to give workshops and uh, they brought along, say, their own followers, people who follow their styles and working methods. And that's how the festival has grown. And as I said, it's that combination of uh, very skillful um, artists who, who do give us the workshops, uh, put on the workshops for us. They've drawn uh, the majority of the participants into the festival. Well, it, so, sounds, it sounds wonderful. So if, if, if I'm uh, uh, somebody who's never done a plein air festival or have never met, never been invited to paint in one, yeah. I can still apply and come. And yeah, yeah. Anybody who, everybody who wants to come gets to come and participate. Is that correct? It is indeed. And it's only, it's for, it's, it's only 75 euros to, to register. And you can take part for the nine days, Eric, which is very reasonable. Um, the bus is extra. It's, it's, it's provided and there is an extra cost for that. Um, they would have to supply their own accommodation, obviously. But, um, so you don't have any kind of a, a way that they can stay with locals or anything of that nature? It's, it's, you've got to buy a hotel room or something. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Unfortunately, that, that, that's... Like, I mean, the, the festival is run by three or four volunteers, if you know what I mean. And there's only so much workload <laughs> that we can, we can yeah. take up. Yeah. And accommodation now would be a very, very tricky one. I was involved in another festival 30 years ago where accommodation turned out to be an absolute nightmare. And that was even with uh, professionals on board, you know. So it's, it's something that does need an awful lot of work and we're not really set up to do that. Having said that, accommodation in Ireland is very easy to get. You know, like uh, Board Fulcher, our tourist board, they have uh, their website uh, will link you with accommodation in any part of the country. And certainly if you wanted to um, look at that in conjunction with our festival, there'd be no, you shouldn't have any difficulties uh, sourcing a place to stay for the few days you're here, you know. Well, I, I think it's fascinating. Now, do you ever have a, a situation where uh, other than painting locations, you have all 200 plus people together? For instance, do you have an auditorium uh, where there are speeches or uh, presentations? I think you said Thomas Kitts is coming over to talk about oh. Soroya in his Soroya video. Are you so there? You have a like a city hall that you use, or what's that like? Yeah, we're using the, our um, local art center for the talks. Uh, we also have um, the National Opera House here in Wexford, so we, we, we that's that's available to us as well if we need it. Um, we hold a, the biggest opera festival in the world here every year. I'm actually, we're very proud of <laughs> Maybe not, but It's not <laughs> the biggest, but certainly the unique one. Unique, unique one, yeah. One, yeah. Um, yeah. And then on the end of the festival, Eric, we all get together for our last hurrah, and we have a gala dinner, um, which is always so much fun. And it's uh, it's fancy dress optional. Um, we have a barbecue have a at the barbecue. start of the week so yeah. people can meet each other we, yeah. socially. We all also have a, have a painter's pint every night. We have a local pub that's been brilliant for us and Team yeah. Harris's. They've been great support for us all th throughout the whole festival over the 12 so years. It, so, yeah. Wexford is a very, very small town. You know, yeah. if it's uh, less than a mile from one end of it to the other, yeah. uh, it's situated on a river, so you very difficult to get lost in it. And as I said, this, uh, where Jane has mentioned, the Painter's Pint, you can walk in there on your own and you're going to meet another artist who's mm. in the festival. Everybody gravitates to that place in the evening. And uh, even if you came on your own, you'll end up meeting a friend there within 20 minutes of walking into it. Yeah, and a couple of the nights we're doing nocturnes mm -hmm. as well. Um, yeah, they're always planning something. So mm -hmm. every night we have something on for everyone. So they have the energy to keep going. Exactly, <laughs> Fabulous. Yeah, it's very fun. Well, yeah. and the pictures are very scenic. It's a very beautiful area. Yeah. Oh, it is. It's a, it's a hidden gem in terms of Ireland. You know, the west coast of Ireland gets an awful lot of publicity. 
but uh, Wexford is is uh, known as the model county. It was uh, probably one of the earliest counties settled by the Normans when they came here, and they their imprint in terms of the field sizes, the castles they built, and things like that it spread the length and breadth of the county. So it's always a visually interesting but very quiet and beautiful spot. And at this time of the year, it shimmers with grain, golden grain, you know, so it's quite magical. The most yeah. difficult color for any artist to deal with. <laughs> <laughs> we have 40 shades of it here, so yeah, it is. We also have a big exhibition. Uh, anyone who takes part is entitled to select uh, up to two works from their work that they've done throughout the week and to submit that for exhibition. Uh, that takes place in a, a lovely gallery. It's a big gallery called the Green Acres Gallery, uh, appropriately. And, uh, and we have 5,000 euro uh, awards given out, shared out amongst uh, prize winners for that. And this year our judges are, uh, are Kevin McPherson, uh, Keiko Tanabe, and James Coleman from uh, from Norwich in the UK. So uh, so they they'll have the work cut out to select from probably about 400 and odd paintings. Uh, so that's that that all the artists will be at that. That's a big that's a big event for us. Yeah, the invited and, artists do can show more than four paintings. Well, they can, but but, but they, they, they have to nominate two for prizes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and are they selling any paintings or, you know, do you okay. have a pro yeah. prospect of recouping yeah. some of your money? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I mean, each year, uh, the amount of the sales goes up uh, quite mm. dramatically now over the last, especially like, I mean, we're coming out of a recession. We had a, we were hit very badly for the years 2008, to about 2014, 15. But since then, and even during the the downturn, you know, uh, people were still buying, but certainly over the last two or three years, the amount of sales are up around the twenty thousand uh, euros. Yeah. You know, I, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't uh, want to sell our event on the basis of making sales because, no. yeah. relative to the U.S., is it wouldn't, it would be relatively small potatoes. The main reason for coming is because you want to see Ireland, you want to take part in this event. It's very friendly and it's easy to do. Uh, once you get here, it's it's quite easy. Uh, we make things as, as simple for the artists participating as we can. You know, you won't you won't come away with a profit, I'm sure, but you will have had a great holiday and a great experience. That's what mm -hmm. we hope and that's what we aim for. Mm -hmm. well, it sounds wonderful. I want to get on an airplane right now. Great, yeah, great. You always want to be uh, oh, and um, so, so you said there's five five thousand euros uh, prize money. Uh, is yeah. that uh, over the? Uh, oh, how many different prizes are there? There would be, say, the mayor's prize, uh, the mayoral prize. That's uh, a thousand euro, and they generally purchased by uh, by the uh, local authority. There's ten prizes in all, as I said. So. The four thousand then is is uh, is uh, divided over the next nine. Maybe. Yeah, and then on top of that, we have a people's choice and an artist's choice, which people vote for. Mm -hmm. uh, we always find they're great for getting visitors to the exhibition to engage with the paintings. You know, you give them a little job, they get a voting card, and you say, "Pick your favorite and put it in the box, the ballot box." There, and people love to do that. And, uh, and of course, we get some support from Plain Air magazine with a, uh, a very valuable prize as well. So it's great to have this opportunity to say thanks for that. It's much appreciated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and we, we, all we, we, love, uh, we love participating in things like this because they're so wonderful for people. Uh, so I'd like to shift directions. I want to talk about a couple other things that I think people would like to hear about. But before that, is there anything else about art in the open and the festival that we need to talk about? Because I want to kind of talk about plein air painting in Ireland and plein air painting in Europe. We also, we, we, we also have a quick draw every Saturday, the Saturday after the week's finished, where people, have, when they've handed in their paintings, we have a quick draw in the town, which is fantastic fun. Um, it engages all the local people in the town. To, they just love to be watching the artists painting yeah. um, over two hours. Or is it two hours? Yeah, about that. We concentrate yeah. them in a small section of the town. So the, 
tripping over each other really yeah. but the locals can see them creating the work uh, the artists uh, it's a participate participate for, a charity. for a charity actually you know and then they give 10 percent. you can buy off the easel at the end of the event and uh, a lot of them do sell at that and uh, they very generously then give 10 percent of the sale price to the charity that we nominate each year you know so it's a it's, it's a fun event really and it, as i say it captures everybody everybody's imagination you know and and creates a lot of joy but that would be probably the that main part of the of the festival you know well congratulations on the festival it's it sounds absolutely wonderful i have friends who have attended and have been telling me to get over there and and, and uh, we've had some some friends from ireland who have attended the conference, the plein air convention, and have been bugging me to get over there. So, uh, I, th I think you know everybody. We should just all descend there one time. And, and you're long so. overdue, Eric. Yeah. Long overdue. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be fun. So, uh, are each of the three of you painters? Yes, we all are. Yeah, two and a half. Yeah, uh, we are. The wine deal. Uh, yes, I like that. I, I, I'm also a half. And, and how, how did plein air painting? Uh, begin for you. How did you hear about it? Uh, have you been doing it a long time? I'm kind of curious how that happened. Uh, well, to tell you the truth, it began. We were all we were all members of a life drawing group, so we used to do that in the evening on uh, Wednesday evening. And afterwards, as Irish people do, we went over to the bar across the road and had a couple of pints. And uh, as, as the summer came around, it was getting a little bit warm and the evenings were longer. And, uh, and somebody said, you know what, we should go out and paint outside. And uh, like a lot of artists, you know, that was a new concept uh, to actually take your easel and your, your paint and go outside. That was something else uh, that, that, that doesn't spring to mind. I know in the States, it's a big movement and you've done your fair share in, uh, in letting people know about it and, and, uh, um, you know, expanding it. But over here, while there's always been a history of Irish artists and UK artists to paint it outside, of course there are, um, it wasn't a common thing for, uh, for, uh, if you like, for amateurs to do. So, um, so we did it anyway. We went out of a weekend uh, we had great fun doing it and we made lots of mistakes and uh, we kind of stumbled through it and we thought, you know what, there must be other people out there, you know, around the country or maybe overseas who know a bit more about this than we do. Uh, and that was really the, the spark to set the festival up. So there have always been individual plein air painters, but it wasn't... It wasn't called that, if you like. It wasn't a movement like it is in the States. Of course, thanks to the internet, we soon found out a little bit of investigation that it was going like wildfire over in the US. And subsequently, we found out little pockets of it and uh, in Europe, in different parts of Europe. And of course, interestingly, it's kind of different in some of the other countries. They all bring to bear their own uh, national uh, flavor to it. Uh, different than the US, different than Russia, different than France, you know, the different countries have their own and maybe that's one of the things that Ireland has because of its geographical location, we're on the edge of Europe, we're English speaking, uh, popular with people from the States and it's a little bit of a melting pot for that. We've, we've had, as the lads mentioned, we've had visitors from 26 countries including Finland and Spain and Italy and so forth, uh, and of course a lot from the United States. And it, it's a chance for people to see other styles, you know, other other um, other traditions, and that, that kind of makes it interesting, I think. Mm. Absolutely, I th it sounds sounds fascinating. And, and you can actually see Eric, like over the years of the festival. I mean, I didn't get to the first one; it was only after that that I discovered plein air painting. Um, so it's taken from there, but. You, so many people come back every year um, and we're friends, but you can see how they've grown. You can see at the exhibition how everybody has grown so much, you know, from their first days of plein air painting. The work of the exhibition is fantastic. You know, it's incredible, um, which is great. You know? and, and, and do you have a, 
Do you have a sense of how many people are plein air painting in Ireland? It's growing little by little. Well, as they yeah, say, yeah, imitation is the greatest form of flattery. A second festival is set up in Dublin, mm -hmm. literally a clone of our own one, you know, to, to cater for a growing demand. You know, there yeah. are people in, in all corners of Ireland painting at this stage, you, or, you know, that are coming out, coming out, uh, out into the open, like the, the West Coast, Southeast, Southwest corner of the country. Dublin obviously has a large population, a million, relative to other settlements in the country. So there's a demand there. And as I say, festivals like ours and uh, the sister festival in Dublin are catering for that demand and making it easy to become a plein air painter in this country now. Well, that's mm -hmm. fabulous. And, and, and you know, what, what will happen is that that will expand and there will be more and more festivals, but the, none will hurt each other. They actually help each other. And that's, oh, what, that's what happened here. You know, when, when we started Plein Air Magazine, I don't think there were more than four or five Plein Air events in America at the time. And uh, today there are probably 250 or 300. Almost all of them are healthy. I mean, they, there are a couple that are struggling here and there, and some of yeah. it is because of decisions they've made. But, but um, you, you know, it's, it's something that people love doing. They love being together. The social aspect, like being outdoors together, um, you, you know, they're creative. And so it's the perfect thing for somebody who's especially, it, it can be any age, but especially somebody who's at that point in their life when they're working all the time, they're like, there's got to be more to life than this, and they want to be more creative. And that's, that's when we see people come on board. You know, they start out in their, their mid-40s, oftentimes early 40s. And, of course, there are a lot of younger people coming in, too, and they're just saying, you know, who needs this work thing? I'm just going to go paint, which is really fabulous. Well, I think you're, you're right there in the sense that, from our own experience, a lot of people, you know, when they do get to their 40s or 50s, they have more confidence, and they're not as easily embarrassed by their efforts in public, you know. A lot of people initially said that they were afraid of the criticism, but they don't get that. They get nothing but encouragement from the public for their efforts, you know. You know, one of the things that I've discovered and, and have other, other people have pointed out, and you alluded to it when we were talking before we actually started the recording, mm -hmm. and that is that um, plein air painters are really generous in giving people, and there's, there's something about it. This is not necessarily true uh, for all all sectors and all industries, but um, ev everybody is just so warm and friendly and helpful, and you know, there's there's no sense of competition. It's even even though they're competing in a lot of cases, everybody's lifting everybody else up, and I think that's a, a fabulous spirit for plein air painting. Well, we agree with that, all right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. we're all very grounded. That's yeah. so. So you have uh, you have an ear to what's happening around um, uh, Europe because you have a lot of people coming from Europe and Russia and, and Scandinavia and so on. What um, what are you sensing is happening in the? Is there a plein air movement happening around the world? Um, I, obviously, Instagram and Facebook are bringing us all together, and we're starting to see people around the world that that we're starting to recognize that are that are getting out there, but. What, what, what's your feel compared to what we're we're going through in America? Are we are is it yet a movement? Is it an early stage? Do we need to do more to get more people interested? It wouldn't be um, it wouldn't be as well organized as in the states. Uh, you know where every state has its own organization and seems to have its own plein air event. Some of the states have several uh, very successful ones. Uh, so it's not quite as well organized as that. We do have groups here who paint out. Uh, we have a, a website called Plen Era, which is a networking site for groups who paint out of a weekend to say, hey, I'm going to such and such a place. I'm going to meet in a, such, an, such a coffee shop in the first place at 11 o'clock in the morning or 10 o'clock or what time. Uh, does anyone want to come and join me? So that's happening in Ireland. Um, in the UK now, it's starting to get going. I think it's fair to say they're actually a little behind us. Uh, in terms of they've sort of seen what Art in the Open has done and now that's sort of developing, particularly around Norfolk. Uh, James Coleman, who I mentioned earlier, is one of our judges. Uh, he's uh, 
he, he is an organizer of uh, Norwich Paint Out um, event, and they, they, they have several around uh, the Norfolk Broads, which is a famous UK area for landscape painting. You know, it's, uh, you get the big skies and uh, and flat fields uh, that um, uh, painters like Edward Sego, if you if if he would be familiar in the states. Um, I love Sego. Yeah, yeah, a brilliant painter. Uh, that's you know that it's basically that and Constable Country. That's kind of what you think, that that's where they're developing. And some of the London organisations, the Institute of Oil Painters, and uh, you know the the, the uh, those are getting together now and arranging days out. And there's also a long-standing group called the Wapping Group who paint up and down the Thames. But that's quite a closed group. You kind of have to wait for a, a, <laughs> wait, you have to wait for a, a new, bad news in the obituaries before you get to, to join that one, unfortunately. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then in Europe, there are a few more on the continent of Europe. Uh, in Brittany, there's one called the Couleur de, de, de Britannia. Uh, it's uh, the colors of Brittany, and that is arranged uh, in France and Spain, they tended to be one day events around different villages. And each village will put up a prize and invite artists to come. They would paint all day on the Saturday. Perhaps they'd have a sort of a fete and a garden party and some food in the evening. And the pictures would be judged and a prize awarded. And that would be the extent of it. But it happens in a lot of places, particularly in France and Spain. Uh, in Berlin, the, it, yeah, the, the, yes, there have been others. There's another a friend of ours has decided to has taken what we've done and has expanded into into Berlin and uh, and, and the surrounding countryside. There's another one in uh, Nordwijk on the coast uh, south of Amsterdam in Holland, uh, which is a traditional area for uh, Dutch painters of the 19th century to go, you know, as they'd go to take the air and, uh, and uh, you know, find some peace and quiet. Uh, as I know you've had in the States, in, uh, is it uh, East Point, is that where you, whereas um, there's a, um, a, a, a tradition of artists going up on, off the coast there. Um, it's the same in Holland, and now they run a, a quite a big event, which is on the go for about 15 years. It's called a Schilders Festival, if you'll pardon my bad Dutch pronunciation. Um, and then uh, we met up with uh, a guy who you know well, Leon Holmes, an Australian artist. Uh, I met I met Leon at Nordvik Festival, and now he's returned to Australia. He's, he's working out of Perth. And he set up an Australian plein air association, and they have an event now. I think that's just kind of getting legs now. So yeah, it is definitely it's expanding worldwide, right. and in some parts of Eastern Europe around Belarus, um, they've also uh, they have events. But uh, perhaps because of the language difficulties, it's not known as plein air everywhere. So if you Google that way, you won't always find some of the ones in Germany, they don't use that term. And uh, in, in parts of Eastern Europe, they just simply don't use that term. So it's a little harder to find them, but they do exist, yeah. Well, you know, I have chills. It, it, to, to think about how this is blossoming worldwide you know, you know I, I, I was not expecting to hear all the things that you just told me that, that, are, um, that are taking place throughout, throughout Europe and, and, of course, Australia. And to think about how this has just started with a little bit of a seed, what you guys did, you really led Europe along the way, I think you did. And that little seed, maybe, maybe it had to do, you know, Mary, you came over to the Plain Air Convention, you got inspired, you, you know, you, you launched this thing. Although I think your thing is older than the plein air convention, isn't it? Oh no! Uh, yeah, I I only joined in with these guys. I missed the first year. I didn't even know about plein air painting on the first year when they started. It was literally after the festival I discovered it. So um, I went to two thousand and nine, and then when I met Laurie here, yeah. and she was telling me about plein air convention, that's when I took off. Yeah. 
I wanted to learn. <laughs> so yeah, I loved it. So went back the second year as well. It well, it's it's changed a lot since you were there the first and second yeah. year. It's it's yeah. uh, doubled or tripled in size. It's it's pretty pretty much fun to to see that many people, at, you know, to watch a close to a thousand people out painting the Golden Gate Bridge. Pretty cool. Um, this coming year, of course, is going to be in Denver. Well, you guys have been absolutely fabulous, and, and I congratulate you on the event. Uh, you're doing great things for plein air painting. You're doing things to expose it throughout the world. Uh, everybody here is aware of your event and is excited, and if, if they're not aware, they're aware now if, they, if they're hearing this. And uh, uh, you just are, are uh, great soldiers in the plein air movement. Thank you so much. Wonderful. Hello. So thank, you for, thank you. Thanks We're for all calling. Very passionate. We'll keep a place for you yeah. whenever you're ready. <laughs> well, it's that yeah. T-shirt this year. <laughs> Could you say no. that one more time? We're going to send you a T-shirt. Oh, I'm going to get a T-shirt. Oh, You're going to wear exciting. it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll probably wear it and I'll post it when I get it. And uh, cool. thank cool. you so much. And and uh, I will get over there one day. I'm kind of waiting for my kids to get into college and then I can start. <laughs> spreading my wings a little bit and yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're looking forward to a big Soroya uh, exhibition that's coming mm -hmm. over it's in the UK at the moment and that opens just when we're finished but uh, as uh, as you know Thomas Jefferson Kitts is a, a sort of an expert on Soroya so we're delighted to have him and he's going to give us a, a Soroya talk uh, so that's something that everybody will be looking forward to yeah. when our festival has ended to go and see that. We don't get very much of Soroya in the UK and Ireland. It's it's pretty rare in the museums that you mm. see them. Uh, I know he's kind of very very well known in the United States, but uh, I, I've never seen one in the flesh. Yet, so I'm really no. forward to that. Uh, they're, they're fabulous. One of the stories uh, that happens from some of these events is uh, that we, I took a group of painters to Cuba, and we had arranged to see uh, the Soroyas in the Cuban Museum in Havana, but when we got there, they had closed the museum, and they wouldn't let us in. And they were, quote-unquote, remodeling it because the building was falling yeah. down. And uh, so the second time we went, we actually got in, and the paintings, they, had, they must have had 30 or 50 of them, and they're fabulous, but they were all dark and cigar smoke-covered, so uh, I volunteered a bunch of people to come over and clean them, and they've given us permission to come over and clean their paintings if I can get uh, the volunteers together and get that done because the paintings are beautiful, but, you know, they're dark. And mm -hmm. uh, so you're, when you see these Soroya paintings for the first time, you're just going to be blown away. They're just so, so fantastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that, that brings up a point. You know, we have, uh, we have our favorites uh, – in the States, you know, the ones that get the most attention are Sar Sargent, uh, who I guess we claim as an American, even though he was pretty much <laughs> raised there. Um, we'll <laughs> Zorn, who is uh, obviously Swedish, Soroya. Um, what, what are some of the favorites that we might not know about? Sago is probably the one that most Americans uh, may not be aware of. Uh, yeah, well, talk a little bit about Sago. Uh, well, Sago in the UK, in Ireland, uh, the main ones would be uh, Paul Henry uh, and uh, Derek Hill. Roderick last year. Roderick O'Connor last year. And Roderick O'Connor, yeah. Well, Roderick O'Connor did most of his work in France. He was a, a sort of an Impressionist and post-Impressionist. Did you say Connor? Roderick O'Connor, yeah. O'Connor or Connor? O'Connor, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and uh, but, but of course, in Ireland, the plein air painters, the sort of famous ones, uh, the guys, most of the, the the likes of Sean Keating and uh, Jack Yates, they all gravitated to the west coast of Ireland, which is, I suppose, most popular with visitors from the states because you got Kerry and Connemara and Galway and the Cliffs of Moher and Donegal up in the north. So the kind of traditional beauty spots that you expect to see, those are all there. And also historically for Ireland, uh, it's kind of, you know, because of our past, colonial past, um, 
uh, and I'm speaking as a Brit here, uh, because of our colonial past, um, it's been seen as a place that artists want to go and celebrate as being somehow kind of more Irish, if you like, than the East Coast, which we're on. But the East Coast, you know, which features Dublin, Wicklow, uh, and down at Wexford, um, you know, has a lot to offer. We've got lots of castles and lots of that sort of thing, uh, lots of little fishing harbors, just the same. But in general, when people think of painting in Ireland, they think of the West Coast. So we've had a little bit of a job to kind of convince people that the East Coast is, is you know, is certainly a lot more accessible and uh, and just as offers just as much. But uh, yeah, in the UK, I guess apart from Constable and Turner, the sort of the great the greats. Um, yeah, uh, since since then, I suppose Edward Siegel would probably be the Wapping uh, Group would be the other, uh, and the Wapping Group. Yeah, yeah. Trevor Chamberlain is a is a, a oh, person I'll be uh, very, very I admire very it's much. Been, I got yeah. to meet him last year. Uh, he's, he's still going strong, and uh, David Curtis would be well very well known. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's a younger group of yeah. artists like Andy Haley Joe Jones, Summers, yeah. uh, Roger Deller, uh, Vicky Norman. Mm. Uh, some of those had, have been to the States and done work there too. So the to and fro between the different these different events uh, as, a, as a, an opportunity for artists to mix is great. You know, we've just had two artists from Ireland in uh, Annapolis for Paint Annapolis. Mm -hmm. As Neil mentioned, we've kind of got a a, a twin city or a sister city, I think, as you call it in America, uh, thing going with Annapolis. And they've been very kind to invite uh, Wexford artists over and we do the same this way. So, uh, so yeah, we're all kind of getting to know each other's favorite painters Mm -hmm. that way. Well, that is fabulous. Uh, it's very exciting, and, and you gave me some good names to Google. I'm looking up, uh, I'll, I'll be looking up Paul Henry, Derek Hill, Rodrigo O'Connor, Sean Keatham, and Jack <laughs> Yates, for sure, and those are the historic yeah. ones. I know Tre- Trevor Chamberlain, and, yeah. um, yeah. and, and so I, I need to touch base with him. This is a good reminder to do that. And uh, Well, you guys have been absolutely fabulous. I really appreciate you taking the time to be on the Plein Air Podcast today. Okay, thank you. thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Look forward to meeting you again soon. Well, thank you again to Neil O'Keefe, Jane Myler, and Tony Robinson from Art in the Open. They're very generous with their time and their information. Their event is July 27th through August 5th. And if you happen to uh, have a couple extra bucks and some time, just get on an airplane, go over and participate. It sounds like a lot of fun. I wish I could. Can't this summer, but I'll get there one, one year. Anyway, let's do some marketing stuff. This is the Marketing Minute with Eric Rhodes, author of the number one Amazon bestseller, Make More Money Selling Your Art, proven techniques to turn your passion into profit. In the Marketing Minute, I try to answer your marketing questions, and you can always email me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. You can also check out marketing. We have a a website that's a blog that's devoted to marketing. It's artmarketing.com. That's easy to remember. Um, Here's a question from Brianna Moore. Don't know where she's from. Brianna says, when starting an art business, is it beneficial to belong to or join art societies? Why or why not? Well, Brianna, thank you so much. I think the answer is absolutely you should join. Anytime you can collaborate with others, be around others, learn from others, you're going to gain knowledge, make contacts, learn about things you otherwise might not know about, and you can usually get some experience participating in shows or exhibits, and it's a great way to find new opportunities. Plus, life's more fun with new friends. I'm a member of uh, many art organizations. I'm a member of the California Art Club. I'm a member of the National Arts Club in New York, the Sal McGundy Club in New York, and, of course, the uh, Plein Air Painters of Austin, Texas, uh, and, and probably a lot of other things I should join. I, oh, I'm a member of the Oil Painters of America, uh, and so there's a lot of stuff like that. And, and so it's nice to be part of national organizations where you can be in the shows and also uh, local organizations. You can learn what's going on. I, I think you're going to get a lot out of it. I highly recommend it. Next question is from, I guess this is an email because it's not a full name. It's Sarah2000. Sarah2000 says, should I ever give my art away? 
Well, Sarah, it's a controversial issue. And first, I'd like to encourage you to listen to the podcast that we did with Barbara Tapp. She talks about giving art away and the benefits she receives from it. Um, so I think that's, that's something that's worth doing. I think also if you're selling your work, then giving it away seems a little counterintuitive. But think about how giving something away might give you some leverage. For instance, giving something away to a charity auction provides a world of publicity and a lot of list building opportunities if you give it away based on the terms that they give you certain amounts of publicity or they mention your name or they do certain things for you, they share their list, whatever. Um, I have a whole section about this in my Art Marketing in a Box uh, program and we also have, uh, I, I do some training about this in the um, Art Marketing Bootcamp v videos. I've talked a, a lot of depth about it there and not so much here. Of course, you can also do it out of the goodness of your heart, but you can also do it to create more leverage in other ways. So let's say that you're, you're in a community gallery and your work is hanging in the gallery and, and in walks Steven Spielberg and he falls in love with your painting, but for whatever reason, he doesn't buy it, he walks out. So you grab him and you say, Steven, 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 listen, I'd love to give you my painting. Now this happened with a friend of mine. She was, uh, I can't tell you who because it's a confidential story, but she was in... Uh, her community gallery, and in walked a bunch of Secret Service agents and then a former president of the United States, and he fell in love with her artwork. Well, she gave him the painting. Now, he could have afforded it, and he may have bought it, but she gave it to him. Why? Uh, well, she wanted to make sure he had it. Uh, she wanted to thank him for his service, but also you could use this. So with a Steven Spielberg or whoever it was, uh, former president, you could use this as leverage, because then you could say, you know, my painting is in the collection of former President XYZ. My painting is in the collection of Steven Spielberg. Of course, you want to get their permission to say that, but I think that's something you could do. You could say, I'll give this to you, but by the way, would it be okay with you if I happen to mention it? Sometimes they'll say yes, sometimes they'll say no. But it helps uh, invest in your marketing story, and I think that's a good thing. You also, um, let's say you wanted a gallery to carry your work, and they just were not flat out not interested what if you said to him, hey, listen, I'll send you one painting. You see if it sells. And if it sells, I'm going to let you keep 100% of the first one that sells. And then if it sells, bring me into the gallery, and then we'll have a future together. That might get their attention. might not, but it might be worth trying. And unless the painting doesn't fit the gallery or it's a piece of garbage, uh, which it probably wouldn't be, then I think that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> there are a lot of other ways you can get leverage, too. So, for instance... Um, paint something for the CEO of a big local corporation. Send a note as a gift or ask to meet them and, and then say, hey, you know, I'd love to do commissions for you in the future. A friend of mine did this, and what he does now is that company uh, has him paint a landscape painting, and they give them uh, as retirement gifts. So he's getting a few thousand dollars for a landscape painting. That They're giving a nice retirement gift in that way. That painting is there in front of those people in their home, and it's a memory of the company that is appreciating them. So there's cool things you can do to leverage. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. Hey, I want to thank you for being here today and remind you to get your seat at the Plein Air Convention fast. I honestly think we're going to be sold out soon. PleinAirConvention.com. Also, July 31st is the deadline to get the super early bird pricing on the Figurative Art Convention in Williamsburg, Virginia. It's going to be a blast figurativeartconvention.com. We call it FACE, Figurative Art Convention and Expo. figurativeartconvention.com. Also, if you've not seen my blog where I talk about life, art, and lots of other cool things, check it out. It's called Sunday Coffee. You can subscribe for free. You can find it by going to coffeewitheric.com. It'll come to you on Sunday mornings. It's always fun doing this. We'll do it again sometime like next week. I'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plen Air Magazine, which you can find at our website, OutdoorPainter.com. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook, 240 Plein Air Painting Tips by some of America's top painters. It's free 
at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.